space has always been the final frontier for mankind. It's honestly quite hard to comprehend how we were able to land on the moon over five decades ago, and since then we never really tried to extend our reach into space. So why is it that over five decades ago we were able to land on the moon, but in the last five decades our reach into space hasn't extended? Although this assumption is not entirely true because there have been a lot of missions during this period that have allowed us to look deeper into space than ever before. The Voyager mission, for instance, was launched to extend the reach of NASA beyond the solar system. At present, the twin Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft are exploring where nothing from Earth has flown before. Continuing on their more than 40-year journey since their 1977 launches, they are much farther away from Earth than they are from Pluto. Voyager 1 entered interstellar space in 2012, and Voyager 2 crossed into interstellar space five years later in 2018. So we have, in a way, been able to send probes beyond our solar system in the last five decades, but the point still remains. As far as advancement in technology to put humans on other planets is concerned, we're still probably where we were when we landed on the moon. So how were we able to develop technology that was able to put humans on the moon all the way back in the 60s? The answer to this is very obvious competition. The Cold War pushed both the USA and Soviet Union into a race where space was seen as the final frontier that had to be conquered. Both countries had nukes and could have finished each other off, along with the rest of the world. It's good that they decided to do that, and instead they directed their energy to compete with each other on getting into space. Both countries have missile delivery systems that could have been used to strike each other. Luckily for everyone on this planet, both the USA and USSR decided to use their missile delivery system to get into space. In 1957, USSR successfully launched Sputnik 1, thus became the first ever country to launch an artificial satellite into orbit. The United States followed suit and launched Explorer 1 the next year. Over the next three years, both countries tested the possibility of manned spaceflight by sending animals into space. And in 1961, USSR surprised the world by sending Yuri Gagarin into space. Yuri Gagarin orbited the Earth for over 100 minutes before returning to Earth and being hailed as a hero in the USSR. The scale of celebration seen in the USSR at this feat was second only to the victory celebrations of World War II. In reply, John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth in 1962. The same year, both countries signed the Outer Space Treaty that basically declared outer space as hallowed territory, with the focus on exploring space to extend human understanding instead of using it for any sort of military activity or advantage. The space race peaked with Apollo 11 landing on the moon, but it seemed that the moon landings had finally quenched the desire to explore space. The American administration surely felt that they'd spent all of its political capital on NASA, and the investment had reaped its result of giving America domination over the USSR. This effectively brought the end to the great space race between the USA and USSR. Although both countries continued to develop technologies to maintain their dominance, the end of the Cold War meant that the sense of competition to beat the other side seemed to have died out. With the end of the Cold War, we got a unipolar world where the USA was not challenged either militarily or technologically by any other country. This, to a great extent, meant that the space missions in the post-Cold War era became very risk-averse. NASA mainly sent probes to study other planets. The International Space Station was built with the collaboration of different countries, so it represents more of a collective effort than a race. So the first space race was fueled by the will to dominate the world, with both the USA and USSR having the capability to wipe each other out. The only unconquered territory was space. Competition and the will to dominate the world fueled the first space race, and these two sentiments are now once again driving the second space race. But first, we need to find out the trigger factor that initiated the second space race. Fast forward to 2002 and zoom in on a man named Elon Musk, who was stubbornly trying to land rocket boosters back on Earth in order to make space travel cheaper. Everyone thought this was a ridiculous thing to try. You can't land rocket boosters. There was a reason why NASA always jettisoned their rocket boosters. Space is supposed to be a one-way trip. Musk initially approached the Russians for support in form of tech and raw materials. He wanted raw materials and rockets for SpaceX, but the Russians turned him down. The USA also didn't really help him much in the beginning, which is why he had to approach the Russians in the first place. His idols turned against him and labeled SpaceX as a failed venture. Rocket after rocket was failing to land. But just like the USSR and USA had learned from their failures back in the 50s, SpaceX was inching closer to success. And in December 2015, SpaceX finally managed to land a rocket booster on land. The precise moment that SpaceX rocket booster landed successfully is the moment that kickstarted the new space race. 
characteristics of the second space race. The first space race was marred with challenges. Space was very much uncharted territory. No one had gone to space before, so everything was an experiment. Needless to say, the USA and USSR overcame great odds to achieve everything they did, from sending the first artificial satellite to creating the International Space Station. The second space race is a bit different from the first one. To start off, there are more players in the race now. USA and Russia are now joined by China, along with India, the European Space Agency, and Iran as well. However, if we are to talk about active and dominant players, then we have to thin down this list. Many countries have put their satellites into orbit. These satellites serve both civil and military purposes. But the ability to have your own satellites can't be used to determine whether the country's in the race, because you can hire SpaceX to put your equipment into space for you. So we need to thin down the list to the countries that have demonstrated the ability to go into space over and over again, with a high success rate. This cuts the list down to USA, Russia, and China. All three of these countries have a sufficient knowledge base to not only send astronauts and probes into space, but also to establish technological edge over each other. In terms of competitive advantage, USA has a clear edge over every other contender right now, mainly because of the cost advantage given by SpaceX. Prior to the reusable rocket boosters of SpaceX, NASA was reduced to such a state where NASA had to use the Russian rockets for its space mission for the International Space Station. The space shuttle program cost NASA around $400 $50 million per mission. Since it was discontinued, NASA switched to Russian Soyuz rockets, which cost around $81 million per seat. With SpaceX, the cost came down to around $58 million per seat, which is so far the most economically efficient option for NASA. America, at the moment, has a hybrid space program, which is headed by NASA but at the same time government funded. NASA mainly works in liaison with private sector companies like SpaceX. This has without a doubt been one of the reasons why the USA has got a major competitive edge over the contenders. The private companies in the USA that are interested in space exploration and commercial space travel have created a competitive market, and this competition is leading to technological advancements at a very rapid pace. NASA recently chose SpaceX to develop the next generation spacecraft to take humans to the moon and establish a permanent base there. This decision came after a very competitive round between SpaceX, Blue Origin, and Dynetics. NASA chose SpaceX because of the low cost and technological edge that SpaceX has over its competitors. For SpaceX, the Artemis mission to take humans back to the moon is going to be a stepping stone to achieve their own goal of colonizing Mars. SpaceX has very recently successfully landed their Starship, which is being seen as a game-changing leap for the company. Russia and China, on the other hand, don't have the same level of technological and competitive edge. They do have the ability to go into space successfully, and they're trailing behind the USA in terms of cost. The cost disadvantage, however, doesn't seem to be hampering the will of China to establish dominance over the USA. China's already constructing their own international space station called Tianzhong-3. It will be smaller than the ISS, but will nevertheless provide China a stepping stone into space exploration. China also aims to land on the moon, but the tentative dates are not yet known. We do know that China is in the third phase, with the fifth phase being a manned mission on the moon. In the third phase, China has successfully demonstrated the ability to send a probe to the moon, land it, and have it bring back samples to be studied here on Earth. The Chang-5 mission was launched from Earth on the 23rd of November 2020. It landed on the moon on the 1st of December and returned to Earth with almost 2 kilograms of samples from the moon on the 16th of December. The next phase is to set up a lunar research station by 2030. Interestingly, Russia and China are collaborating with each other, sharing resources and knowledge to speed up the next phase. If we see this as a race, then clearly the USA looks to land back on the moon before the end of the decade whereas Russia and China are going to catch up probably a few years later. Now, while all of this space exploration sounds really good and progressive for the human race, just like last time, there's an element to the space race that's linked with establishing technological and military superiority over others. Just to be clear, military superiority in space doesn't mean having spacecraft shoot laser beams at each other like in Star Wars. No, we aren't quite at that level yet. Although the USA does have a new space force, which is a military arm of the U.S. military, extending into space. Does the creation of Space Force nullify the Outer Space Treaty? Will it lead to other countries creating similar units to combat each other in space? Only time will tell. What we know for certain, however, is that space is now a strategically militarized zone. We've not yet seen epic battles in space, but satellites provide strategic communications ability to every country today. 
Militaries can use satellite communications to get a real-time picture of war zones. In addition to this, the navigational systems allow militaries to guide their missiles. The GPS navigational system is a strategic asset for the USA, while a lot of countries use GPS for their civil and military needs. We can see that China and Russia have their own satellite-guided navigational systems. Russia uses GLONASS, while China uses Baidao navigational systems. Interestingly, we can see alliances forming around strategic space assets. India has its own navigation system for its military assets, and we can see Pakistan opting for the Chinese Baidao navigation system for their military assets. Pakistan think tanks say that it was far too perilous for Pakistan to use American GPS since India and America are allies and it was a strategic move to use Chinese Baidao, as China has been Pakistan's long-standing ally. Real-time communications can decide the course of a modern war, which is why we can see increased focus on communication and navigation. SpaceX is currently creating its Starlink constellation that will allow the Internet to be beamed down from space. SpaceX has already stated that the constellation will have both civil and military dimensions to it. What this means is that with Starlink, the USA will once again have a technological edge over the rest of the world in communications. Currently, internet data travels through fiber optic cables that are laid down deep within the oceans, connecting the world together. The risk with submarine cables is that they can be sabotaged. Let's look at India, China, and Pakistan as an example who are all three nuclear-armed neighbors that can absolutely not afford any misunderstanding. The internet data for Pakistan comes through submarine cables passing through India. After the recent scuffle between the two countries in 2019, Pakistan asked China to lay down a completely new fiber-optic cable that can end the dependency of the country on the internet data coming from India. This is how USA sees Starlink. With Starlink, USA will no longer be dependent on fiber-optic cables for data and communication. With internet being controlled by the Starlink satellites, USA can possibly get a higher level of security from cyber attacks than it has right now. This is perhaps why China is increasingly focused on 5G and 6G as a radio-based alternative for high-speed internet. The new space race has just begun, and there's a lot to come our way. So far, USA seems to have a very comprehensive lead, but if China and Russia join forces, they can give some good competition to the USA. Let's hope that the space race focuses more on the collective achievements of mankind to help us discover answers and solve our problems instead of military agenda. For now, at least, only time will tell who will come out and be the first to truly explore the galaxy. Until then, I guess, watch this space. Get it? Space? Anyway, what do you think of the current space race? Do you think the USA will be the nation to conquer space first? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more, well, then don't forget to subscribe to the channel and press that bell icon to stay updated whenever we release a new video. Other than that, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.